Genesis 1.27. Popular verse. You probably, if you've been around, you probably heard it. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. main thing I want to try to throw out here is so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Right now in America, there is such a battle for identity and image and it's this. This is the spiritual root that's raging in our country. And the devil is always trying to distort God's image in us. Because if he distorts that image, yes, it messes us, us up. It keeps us from having knowing our full purpose. keeps us uh, from having a fulfilling life. But that's not even his base motive. His base motive is when he destroys the image of God in us as a people, in us as individuals, he laughs, I believe, at God and says, I no longer can see them, see you in them. They look more like me than they look like you. He's trying to get back at God. And so I'm just going to start this today. We'll we'll pick it up next week. uh, Since, just because, you know... We're in no hurry. But there are several... There are several lies that's going around America. uh, It's not just America. It's humans all over the place. There's all these lies being told by the devil to try to keep you from him. And when you're from him, you do not ever start looking like him and reflecting his image. And one of them is God is upset with me. When I first came here into this territory, I won't go into all the details, I was absolutely amazed at the condemnation and the judgment that is put on Christians by many preachers that God is out to get them. Or another lie, God is far away. And it's hard to get from you. You can just see Him off at a distance. Let me just be blunt. If God was out to get you, you would be gotten. He's not that bad and you ain't that good. You can't hide from Him. He knows where you're at. You know, on Apple, you have a little Find My. Sometimes people and families join Find My. You can tell where other people are by looking on Find My. I don't know what it's called in Android, but they got something similar. He's got one of those on you. He knows how to find you. And he doesn't even have to get his Apple iPhone out. And so if he wanted to get you, he would have. It's just a crazy, nonsensical story. And so I want to... um, Let's just jump into another common story. And then I'm going to talk... And we'll talk more about it next week, probably. But if you turn over to Luke 15, the prodigal son story. And... Out of this, I want to, I want to show you three things every human needs. The prodigal son, many of you know that story. The prodigal son, in the end, got three things from his father. These are the three things every human being needs on the planet. Let me just read it to you real quick again. I think most of you know this story. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the state. So he divided his property between them. Verse 13 in chapter 15. Not long after that, the younger son got all, together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. If you'll remember, I'm going to summarize. He spends all his money, his friends leave, because they weren't true friends. They were just hanging around him because he bought them drinks and girls, and or guys, or whatever they, whoever they were. And then he, and he had no money. Nobody would hire him. He ended up feeding the pigs. He said, what's my pay? He said, you can eat the same thing the pigs did. Do. Um, verse 17. When he came to his senses in the pigsty, he said, how many of my father's servants have food to spare? He's like, I just want to go back as a servant. It sounds so spiritual. We often say that with Jesus Christ. And if I just want to be a servant... 
and here I am starving to death. Verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. So he's coming back and he's, he's repenting of his behavior. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now this is a cool phrase right here in verse 20. It's, it's, it's rebuking this idea that the father is upset with us and he's far away. But while he was still a long way off, he repented, but he had to walk home. They didn't have Ubers. He wouldn't have had the money for an Uber anyway. Uber donkey service. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, you got to remember, there wasn't a YMCA on the way to take a shower. He was still covered in pig slop. And the father was looking for him. He was waiting for him to repent of his ways. As I often say, bow his knee to the will of the father. And that's what he did. He repented, bowed his knee to the will of the father, came back. And the father eagerly hugged him and kissed him. We could talk weeks about it. Maybe we will. But that's the same way he is with you. The son said, verse 21... Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. How many times do Christians do that? I'm going to serve you. I hope that's my highest office, but I'm not worthy to be called your son. This is the deal. The sons do not get to pick whether they're going to be called sons or not. The father picks who's going to be called sons. He called you son when you were uh, growing in your mother's womb. Or slash daughter. There's no genders here. And so he gets to pick, not us. You can run away like he did and pretend like you're not connected, but you are still his son. And so in a minute, verse 22, we're going to talk about the three things he gave them. But I want to tie this cultural thing in. I'm trying to see. There is, is all the kids in the nursery? Otherwise, I'll really guard my language. Is all your kids in the nursery? All right. I'm not going to be gross here, but it, I would definitely go to the extreme. I'm a federal contractor, so I get working for the United States Customs and Immigration Service, a company that works for them. So I get all the federal emails that they blast to everybody, you know, no matter where they're at. And DHS, uh, Secret Service, whatever thing there. You get them all day long because we're on that email list. And so, as you may know, this is Pride Month. And so... It has broken my heart seeing all these emails in their language. And so I'm going to paraphrase it because it ties into this. Um, and I don't know if you work for a company that's into it. My company that I am actually work for as a contractor of the federal government is big into it too. So we've got all these luncheons you can go to to learn how to be proud of who you are. And so, But it breaks my heart. This is not a message against sexual orientation, okay? This is a message about identity. Most of these emails and most of these people that are talking, they are trying to suck out, suck life out of who they sleep with. Okay, I'm a heterosexual. I cannot get my life out of who I sleep with as a heterosexual. Okay, well, let alone homosexual or lesbian. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's bad. I mean, I mean, we know what the Bible says. This is my point. Your identity is not going to come from your orientation of your body. And this is what's so sad, because they're all talking about identity. I read the emails. They're proud of it. Pride is actually a sin. Have you ever noticed the, the, the rainbow flag, the, the, the pride flag is six colors, and the rainbow flag is actually seven colors? Six is the number of man. There's a lot of these subtle things going on there. So what this isn't about your orientation. I don't want to get weird enough. This is about, I see a whole generation, you will never get your identity from a physical, sexual orientation. Maybe that's your preference. That's a talk for some other time. But it breaks my heart because I don't care how far you go into this. I don't care if the whole world celebrates you at that level. You will never 
be satisfied. You will never, even if, if your thing is sleeping with as many women as you, as a guy as you want, you will never be satisfied. Okay? So I'm not denying that, but what bothers me is your identity has to come from the Spirit. Because when you were created and got a physical DNA, you also got a spiritual DNA from the Father when He breathed into you. Adam and Eve was, Adam was, was created, but he was just lying there as a body with a soul. There was no life. As you go back and read Genesis, until the Father breathed into him. And you were breathed into in the womb. And you got your purpose and destiny. And part of that purpose and destiny is to know the Father. And so this lie that is prevalent among Christians, I'm not even talking about different orientations. I mean, they really think God's mean to them and God hates them and God's out to them. Well, that's a whole other topic. But there's a lot of Christians, and it's been getting better the 30 years I've been here. But this religious spirit, God's out to get you. You're going to lose your salvation if you sin once. Um, all this nonsense, he's far away, you can't meet the Father face to face, is just putting people into bondage and it breaks my heart. And it's a lie that the devil is using us to keep us from the Father. Because he created you to be face to face. After Adam and Eve died, after Adam and Eve died, died, after Adam and Eve sinned, they, they put on fig leaves, they hid, they went running off into some bushes, and then God walked through, the, it says, in the cool of the Garden of Eden, He walked through the Garden of Eden. And what were the three words that He said to these people that disobeyed Him? Where are you? It was not, you're going to die. You're going to be a crispy critter. You're going to get burnt up. You're going to get what you deserved. It was a cry of relationship that still goes across the thousands of years since then of where are you? It was the same way as we get back to the, to the prodigal son story here and we'll, we'll tie this up and end tonight. But if, you know, it doesn't say he said where are you, but it says he, in some versions, says he was on the edge of his boundary of his, of his land looking for his son probably going, where are you? What far off city are you doing? Now, he didn't chase him into the gutter, but he was still welcome to receive him back once he repented. Now, this is the hardness of the gospel. The hard It's simple, but it's hard to do. Whenever we repent, he repented of his ways. He had to get in the gutter of the pigs before he did. But once he repented, and he could have repented anywhere along the way when he had half his money. When he had all of his money, when he had a quarter of his money, he could have repented and come back. And, and he would have at least had that. But he had to wait till he had given it all out before he would bow his knee. And that is the eternal question. If you're, suff- if you're suffering with sexual identity issues, sexual whatever it is, other identity issues, this is going to be hard. It's simple to say it's hard to do. The path... The, the path to freedom and acceptance and knowing who your identity is, is to say, I repent and I bow my knee. What do you mean by that? I'm going to stop doing it the way I want to do it because I think my way is best. And some people, it takes decades to get there. Some people, it takes days. uh, And some people never get there. So I'm just encouraging, if he's telling you to do small things, big things, the answer is always yes. Yes. You may not know how to get there. You may not know how to do it. But that's not the main question. You just say yes. And then you go, okay, how do I get there? And then he starts doing, meeting the three needs that this prodigal son had in everybody. Um, uh, let me just read it, then, then, I'll, then we'll talk about it. The son said to him, I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. The father ignored that. He didn't even answer it. He just said, he just said, well, he's my son. We're going to keep going on with this. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, and I'm going to tell you what they said, and I'm going to apply it to us. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then we're going to have a party. 
We hear the story about bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. So then they had a party. He loves parties. Parties is a spiritual thing. The more churches have parties, they're probably more like the Father. So he got a sandal, he got a ring, and he got a robe. Now this is Craig. This is my opinion. You can take it. I think the principles apply. Maybe it's a stretch with these three things. You can decide. I I think every human being on the planet, including me, needs three things. Three A's. If you'll remember this, when you're talking to people that are unbelievers, they need these three things. It's to be accepted... It's to be affirmed, A-F-F-I-R-M-E-D, accepted, affirmed, and assigned. Let's talk about that real quick. Everybody needs a father to hug them. Physically and spiritually. Now, you have to do it. You have to, you have to go back and go, I want a, I want a father. I want you, father, to hug me. And, um, That, I believe, is the meaning of the robe. When he gave him that robe, without even taking a shower, robes back then meant statuses in families. It's sort of like now, maybe the closest thing now is when you go into a hospital, the CNAs have black uniforms, the nurses have, I don't know what color they have, maybe blue, but there's different color uniforms based on their positions in the hospital. Doctors got something else. And so, they got the white, usually the white robe that they put around them, or white shawl, or whatever you call it. And so, um, that's what this meant. When he put that robe around, it wasn't because he was cold. It's like, you are still my son. Yes, you screwed up. Yes, you wasted all your money. And there will be consequences there. He probably had to ask for money the rest of his life, but he had the Father's love. Sin has consequences. But that doesn't keep you from the Father. That's the difference. He still gave him that robe. He said, you are accepted. You're a son. We're going to get through this. And then the affirmed. Everybody needs to be affirmed. Another word, I used affirm because it started with A. Another word is encouraged, exhorted, uplifted. Everybody you know, from the the sinner that's in the pig's trough, to each of us, we know we need to know we're accepted. That's why so many people do crazy things. They're trying to get attention and accepted, and they may get their 15 minutes of fame on Instagram or with you. But long term, you only feel accepted when you've learned to be in the presence of the Father, and that's a, another subject. And then they need to be infirm, affirmed, encouraged. The the ring, I believe, showed his affirmation. The ring was another family thing, saying you're a part of this family. They used it to sign legal documents and did other things. And he said, you're you're a part of this family, and I'm going to affirm you that you still have a place. And then the last thing was assigned. Um, Genesis 128, which comes after Genesis 127, which we read earlier about being created in God's image. I'll read it again. God blessed them, said, Be fruitile, increase in number, fill the earth, and be its master. Rule the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals. The sandals means he put sandals on his feet so he could go places. So his feet weren't rubbed raw by the rocks. He gave him a ring, gave him a robe, he gave him sandals, and said, I will continue to use you. Probably some cleanup. Go take a shower first. Let's figure out what your role is. But as you're, as you're going through the lines at Walmart and you're seeing that cash register lady or you're seeing the person in front of you with, you know, is having a hard day, I, I do this all the time. They want to be accepted and they're trying to figure out all the ways they can be accepted. And when I look at the Pride Month and all the whole alphabet soup deal, it breaks my heart because I'm going... Is the height of your purpose who you sleep with? And they'll say yes. And I'm like, how pathetic of a purpose is that? How far have we fallen from the image of God and from Him accepting us and Him affirming us in that and in Him assigning us? That's where you get your identity from is running to the Father and bowing your knee. 
and all the other stuff that I just mentioned, you know, whatever. It is a... I cannot believe America has bought that lie from the devil and saying this is something to be proud of. Even if, if, even if it was heterosexual month, why would we have a June Pride month for that? There is so much more that the Lord has for us to be proud of, to change our world, to metaphorically rule over the fish and the sea and, and the birds of the air. Y'all follow, get my purpose here? And so when I see that, my heart breaks. I'm going, your, your identity is in something that you will, it will never do anything. It's just not what your spiritual DNA is created for. And if you, if you see that, it will help you to have compassion on people and go, okay, this is not the issue, what you're doing over here. I mean, the Lord, if you get become a Christian, He'll deal with it. But the issue is, have you run back to the Father? Have you bowed your knee to Him? And in Him, He'll hug you. And in Him, He'll put a robe on you. And in Him, He'll put sandals and a ring on you. And what does that mean? Over time, you'll find out why you were created. Not this pathetic why that the devil is perpetrating in most denominations in America for perpetrating per- 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 it. Prep- whatever the word is. And so, why are the churches doing this? Because they've lost. They don't know the Father. I'm just going to be blunt. They do not know the Father. If they knew the Father and knew how to run into Him, they would never do this crap. And so it makes me sad for the churches that are doing it. It it tells me, you do not know the Father. I don't care what your byline is. You know, love is the same in any language or some nonsense. Love is defined by the God of love. And you have to go into His presence and let Him define it the way He wants to define it. Y'all get what I'm saying here? Hopefully you get my heart here. So everybody needs to be accepted, affirmed, and assigned. And if you'll think about it and meditate on it over the next several weeks, you will see that is some of the root causes of all humans. What do we do to get accepted? It's usually something to get attention, but after the 15 minutes of fame, it's like you're more depressed than you were before. And then how do you get encouraged? And then, what is my assignment? His assignment for you is much bigger than you could ever figure out on your own. If if the assignment He has for you doesn't scare you, it's your assignment. When He gives you an assignment, you go, what? This makes me nervous. How am I supposed to get there? He goes, the problem is, it's not how you're supposed to get there, it's how you and I are supposed to get there. He loves doing stuff. He is a sanguine extrovert. He loves hanging around people. Amen. Hopefully you hear my heart on that.